Tesla is slashing prices in China, but Tesla's fundamentals haven't changed. We have a huge Twitter overhang. Many people are discussing on Twitter because Elon is changing Twitter so much and doesn't focus on Tesla. God damn it. Or is it just a super Black Friday sale right now? Uh, we don't really know. And today I've hit a huge milestone that I want to share with you. And for all of that, I've invited again the man, the, the absolute chat. Here is Farzad Misbahi on the channel again. Uh, yeah, uh, Farzad, how about you introduce yourself to the audience again and we're gonna start the episode. Let's jump right in. Sure, man. Thank you so much for <laughs> inviting me uh, on this very special okay 1,000 subscribers, yeah, bro. Yeah, we've hit it. 1, Wait a second. Wow. We, have to, we have to hype it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we've yeah. did it. We've did it. Um, um, I, I, my goal was uh, to to reach thousand subscribers um, at the end of the year, but we've reached it a little bit earlier. Fantastic. And Fantastic. yeah, I mean, yeah, man. your your YouTube journey journey skyrocketed. Really, I, I'm I'm not that lucky because I'm not putting as much work in into YouTube right now, sadly. <laughs> but uh, this might change if if I kept keep the ball rolling. But um, Farzad, I want to, first of all, I want to talk to you about your uh, own YouTube journey when we are at it right now, because uh, now we have something to celebrate yeah. a little bit. And um, I think you can, because you, you've grown your channel very, uh, very fast in the last year. Um, it's amazing what happened um, in that time. And, and your merch is awesome. I mean, you, you drop merch now. <laughs> now uh, all the boxes are checked to uh, get full force into the YouTube game. That's great. I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman. <laughs> who said that? That's a quote. Let's see who knows that. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, thank you so much. I, um, it's been a wild ride. It, honestly, dude, like you deserve and more the, the, the support you've been getting. I think your content is just so unique, so well produced. It's clear. Uh, your talent shines right through. Thanks. So uh, really, congratulations on on your journey, and I think this is just the beginning for you. It really, it it really is just a, a time thing, right? So if I'm going to speak about my journey, I think I've been extremely lucky in the fact that the journey I've been on, say f since like ten years ago, with 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 Tesla as a company being my you know one of my very first investments, then having worked at the company for a while, so these were things that gave me a little bit of an edge. Uh, which I'm very lucky to have. So, but at the same time, I'm I'm one of a, a, a trillion YouTubers out there that mm -hmm. put out really good content, right? So, I'm I'm just very fortunate to have. If it's one person listening to my stuff, I, I feel fortunate, you know. But but the fact that it's it's doing quite well, and I'm very very um, happy with with how it's doing is gives me motivation to come mm -hmm. out every single day and and try to put something together that people will enjoy or people will find value in. You know, I think it's been a it's been almost a I think it might be a year on the day, maybe tomorrow. Honestly, oh which crazy. Is kind of crazy, that's so like crazy. you're celebrating. You wow. know, your thousands today. I think my first video was November 17th, if I remember correctly. I'll have to that, go back that and might check, be true. That might be true. I, I, I that think was so. the first time. Um, it, was it, what was your first video? The one that you talked about your Tesla journey that you work while working yeah. there? It's like 50 minutes long or yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Crazy. Oh, this. Uh, it was right around that time. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Crazy. <laughs> it's like, it's completely wild. But if I, if I go back and reflect for that year, it's. I, somewhere halfway through, it sort of went away from being a hobby for me mm -hmm. to being something that I wanted to take more seriously. Because the one thing I started to find out was that folks, like folks were valuing my content, they were valuing what I was mm -hmm. saying. And for the longest time, as a human being, one of my biggest weaknesses is uh, confidence. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always lacked confidence. And, and so... What I mean by that is, if I'm saying something, something in the back of my head is always saying, "Well, you're not like, who are you to say this?" Mm -hmm. It's imposter syndrome. You know, I don't know if mm -hmm. I don't know if, if you're familiar with that concept. Yeah, but I think a course, lot of us, of course, I think totally. all of us struggle with it, to be yeah. honest. And that always gnaws away at me uh, constantly. But I think the, the YouTube journey has given me so much confidence to say, "Hey, listen." Even if it's one person that's viewing your stuff and, mm -hmm. and you're building this community around that one person, that <laughs> yeah. means there's one person out there that connects with you in some way. So that gave me so much confidence to come out and try to be more open about how I think about things and try to really 
um, I don't know, just try to be me, try to Mm -hmm. be me as much as possible. And I think what I'm finding out through this YouTube journey is vulnerability and honesty are two things that are so important. They're so important. Absolutely. Because it's a visual medium, you know? People can see you as Mm -hmm. you're talking. People can see the little, you know, the your eyes moving around and and your your lips moving around and your facial expressions. So if you're not being yourself, if you're not fully being yourself when you're saying something, people are gonna notice and Mm -hmm. people are not gonna view that thing as trustworthy. And trust is one of my biggest uh fundamental things as a person it's like trust has to be the number one thing that's how societies and civilizations function Mm -hmm. it's all based on trust the fact that the u.s dollar is the top currency in the world is because people trust that it's going to be the best currency that they can put their money in right so that's that's how the world works so yeah something shifted in my head for this channel at some point and i'm trying to figure out ways on how to I don't know how to build more on that. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it's it's Tesla Tesla related, Elon related, but also like maybe more things. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how can I advance the discourse from that perspective. And, and even if you agree or disagree with me, like how can I add value to the conversation? Yeah. But yeah, I've been thinking about this stuff a lot. The Twitter thing blows my mind because that's <laughs> right straight into that wheelhouse totally. where my yeah. head's going towards. So, and I'd love to get your thoughts at whatever yeah. point, you know, especially you as a content creator too. But yeah, it's been wild. It's been completely wild, very grateful. And it's teaching me so many lessons yeah. that I never knew uh, I would learn. Yeah. And it's, I'm, it's so grateful. Yeah, I want to add something there because um, you've touched on many points that are very important, I think, um, to realize. I think we, uh, in the beginning of 2000s, around that time period, um, we went through a period of fake it till you make it. People were like um, yeah. a lot of um, like facade and they had their facade and guard up and um, weren't, uh, weren't authentic. That's why YouTube came along and suddenly people uh, got a real personal connection and the whole content game and the media game changed totally upside down with social media because mm-hmm. it's now normal people like you and me uh, not not um, professional uh, broadcasters uh, suddenly had a voice and um, I think um, this shifted very much and like you said authenticity is the most important thing and if you we are all human we have flaws I have flaws I, I can be wrong um, on many occasions I um, I try to my best to to be as neutral as possible in the sense that I don't uh, misinform people. For example, uh, with me, yeah. for example, my flaws are a little bit like uh, in the direction of that I talk in absolute terms more or less, but I don't really mean them. I mean them as well, and but I'm very convincing. That's a, a huge flaw that I have. For example, that I want to try to balance it out with. Uh, have more facts in the background to to don't misinform people because mm. um yeah because that's what, the way I think I, I my my <laughs> thought <laughs> my thought process is inside of my mouth you could say when I talk I, I form the form the thoughts I don't really am this thinker type um, I'm more spontaneous and that's why yeah but enough well, of I me re- but I can relate to that though yeah I can relate to that because I feel like it, it's it's hard not to be that when you when yeah. you get into the YouTube flow. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? I don't know yeah. if, you, if you agree with yeah. me on this, but like once you know that folks are 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 listening to mm-hmm. you yeah. as a person, you feel like okay, I I, I you almost like want to be like okay, but but people trust me. Like I have to ensure yeah. that I'm you know conveying that trust and, back, and then yeah. that it's a trap. It's such a trap, yeah. bro. It's <laughs> such a trap. It's crazy. I don't all the content I watch from you, dude. I don't think you're giving a, in a, yourself enough credit that you are quite quite analytical. You're yeah, very yeah. fact based. I I, I try find my the best. fact that um, yeah. it's one of those things like the weaknesses that mm-hmm. you're over overly critical on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's are the ones one. that never show because you're overly critical on them. You know, it's mm-hmm. like it's a, a, ful- a self fulfilling prophecy, and that takes a lot of awareness. And it's obvious that you have it, but yeah, just human beings are crazy. Yeah. Like we're so weird. Yeah, we are so weird. That's yeah, what it really comes fun. down to. We're all so weird. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's it's crazy. And and um, yeah, also the the points you said with the imposter syndrome and stuff. I think that's uh, also a huge thing. But I think uh, in your case, I I view it as um, you have uh, some kind of humbleness that you are humble. That why is m- why should anyone care? What I have to say at first, like like that's sure. the, your approach, and you're very cautious of okay. I don't want to uh, elevate myself over other people. I think that's this, and that's why you you dampen yourself a little bit down and say, okay, I'm not, I don't know if 
I'm in the position, but now you you get your um, receipts all the time that people listen to you and really value your opinion. And I, I think you're doing a great job. I, I really love your type of content that you've started, you. You, your community forum stuff that you... And I have to say, I have to give you huge credit for launching my channel, really, because I was on the cusp. I had so much to do besides uh, everything else. I've, I've just had a baby uh, half a year ago and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do the jump. And because of your interview we did b for my master's thesis, um, I, I was like, okay, I, I wanted to do a Tesla channel. I'm going to do it now because I'm in the production space for a very long time now. And I have every mm -hmm. equipment here already. And why shouldn't use it for, for a YouTube channel? And I'm glad to do it now with the thousand subscribers. This a huge milestone and I will grow um, eventually step by step. And I love that I can engage with my audience. That's the most important thing. For me, like you said, yeah. if it's 100 or 500 or 1,000 or one person, uh, that's you're so grateful to have somebody to um, have a small audience. And um, yeah, I s always see uh, people recurring. And uh, yeah, I'm also very grateful yeah. for that. Yeah. But yeah. Of course, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my pleasure. I think I think everybody should have a freaking YouTube channel. Yeah. And I, that's yeah. like kind of like, I think that's what Twitter is going to be in the long term, mm -hmm. honestly. I think it's sort of that thought process, the town square and how everybody's going to be able to sort of put their ideas out there for us to like think through. Anyway, I don't want to divert yeah. the conversation too no, no, much because I know you have it. Yeah. I, perfect transition <laughs> yeah. now because I want to talk to <laughs> you about Twitter. I, I Last time you did your episode with the community forum, you talked about Twitter and their functionalities and I was biting my nails here. I was setting everything up and said, <laughs> Get, put me on, but but the stream was already... Uh, Saw your comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> writing comments all the time because I have to talk to you about this because I have a, a pretty different opinion on that and th that that might sure. be the first point we really disagree on a little bit um, because um, I'm from the media space and um, I've ob I'm observing um, all this stuff very closely and also how to produce apps how to produce websites um, human behavior human centric design stuff like that because I'm a designer, I'm I'm in that field. And it is so damn hard to get people to use your service at first. It's just plain and simple, this. The good thing is Twitter is a brand that already established. So there we have a platform that is already used and Twitter is one of the OG social media platforms. That's very important. I mean, many social media platforms already tried it. For example, Vero, Vero was a thing from Saudi Arabia funded app that uh, was spreading in Germany very much and in Europe, but it didn't, uh, people subscribed to it because they had the premise, if you don't subscribe now, later you can't and stuff like that. So, so they, that's mm. why they did it. And they also had huge influencer campaigns, but, and they had great functionality, but the problem is people don't, simply use your platform because you have good fun functionality and that's my critique critique point um in that regard um twitter is established but um even if elon does uh, a good job engineering the server side and engineering the technical uh, stuff of twitter and adding functionality that uh, um that is there doesn't mean that people will use it and doesn't mean because the audience decides the fate of Twitter, not Elon Musk. That's that's my view. Maybe you can add something to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, um, so I think about it differently. Mm -hmm. So why, why do you go on YouTube today? To watch, why do you go on YouTube? To watch, uh, get in, inform myself, for example. Yeah, that's mostly that. And right. to write... Yeah, and uh, prepare my videos. Is, is that tied to a person or is that tied to the to the product or the service that you're using? Um, it's tied to the people there, yeah. Uh, the people to the I people follow. That are creating the content. Yeah, and also, of course, the platform has right. to be make it as easy for me as possible to get to my creator that I want to view. There you go. That's it. That's all you gotta do, right? So, so it, it becomes. It does truly become a, the way I view it as. I think it becomes an engineering problem uh, or a problem. It's a. It's a service or product problem that has to be solved, which is to create something that's going to attract the best quote unquote talent or cre creators to this platform that will then create content 
for people that that they want to watch. And so how do you do that? You create incentives around uh, payouts. You create incentives around um, how to build a, a community. You make tools that are incredibly easy for creators. So, you know, I had a whole thread where I'm like, dude, auto thumbnails, auto tags, auto chapters. Like these are AI driven solutions. Mm -hmm. And Elon theoretically has tapped the most brilliant software engineers and AI folks in the planet mm -hmm. through the FSD and the bot program. So in theory, he should have a network that he can leverage mm -hmm. to be able to create those tools. But like that's that's just kind of surface level. It's 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 as basic as just make sure you know when we go on YouTube Studio and we and we create stuff on YouTube Studio and we upload things and we have the analytics and all that stuff. You know, very easy to upload, relatively easy to set up your video for however you want it to do to add the tags to monetize it, so on and so forth. Have that on Twitter. And then do some next level stuff from a from a development standpoint to really make it a no brainer for a content creator to come in and say, "I'm going to use Twitter because I'm going to get paid more. It's going to be easier for me to uh, to grow faster, and I'm going to have community tools that are going to really enable me to get really close with my community. So, like leveraging things like Spaces, for example, like right on the platform on YouTube, you can't. There's no way for you to like really get close with your community. It exactly. kind of sucks, yeah. and and the comment section is a mess. So how do you create a community? You have to like get creative. You use Patreon, you use Twitter. Mm -hmm. you, you, you do this, you know, the community forum for me was a way to like supersede mm -hmm. YouTube's lack of community building. Yeah. Cause I'm like, okay, like what the hell's going on here? Like I literally, half the comments are trolls or bots. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always like, a Judy is the best financial advisor ever. And then 35 <laughs> God, bots under yeah. it with a thousand likes. Uh, it's the worst. Mm. You know, you know exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. I'm, I'm so Twitter, Twitter is phenomenally good at that. I think Twitter's unique advantage is community building. Even if the community building for the longest time has been quite toxic, yeah. <laughs> it's still it's still a community. Yeah. I think that can't that can't be ignored. And so in the case of Elon and his teams, they are ultimately the best problem solvers in the world. And from a solutions perspective, Twitter is very much an engineering problem. Now, where it gets difficult, it's going to be um, executing, I think, against the different jurisdictions that have different laws and regulations that could uh, present a problem and, and sort of the complexities behind that. If, you know... Elon operates in all, every single country with Twitter, and then there's like some hazy laws that are say, quote unquote, anti-humanitarian, then it, it, it just opens them up for potential sort of, you know, attacks. But, but what's going to end up happening, I think, is, you know, he's going to say, hey, that's, the law is the law. I'm not going to impose U.S. laws in, say, Saudi Arabia or mm -hmm. China or wherever else Twitter is going to operate. They're the laws, so we're just going to do that. And if people want to change the laws, they should change the laws. Like I'm just going to execute based on whatever laws are there, and that's going to be a pretty ironclad way of executing against it. What do you think? What do you think about my uh, proposition so far? Uh, yeah, first of all, for example, the last thing, the last point you've um, said um, with the laws is right. For example, in America, you have freedom of speech, which which is a um, broader than in Germany, for example. In Germany, you can't deny the Holocaust, for example. It's under law that you, you are not allowed to deny that because we had so much uh, misinformation after the war because propaganda was still so strong. That's why we had to regulate this um, and stuff like that, which is really, really good because, it, yeah, it's obvious what happened there, um, especially yeah. to us uh, Germans. We were, we were so near to everything and um, also in school we had a lot in history about this dark period um, so we know I hope uh, that we still know a lot of about this but um, but you're right um, you have to adapt and this could be easily done that you have different moderation um, um, per, per different moderation laws per or, or rules for different countries but I'm not um, as convinced um, because uh, I know what you mean that that um, Twitter is a good way to build a community. I agree with that a lot, but still, I think the functionalities that you want to add. He wants to do the everything app, like WeChat is, is the reference point there, or it will be better than WeChat. But the WeChat uh, was built up uh, in a unique market where the CCP just didn't allow any other app. That's or more or less because uh, Google isn't operating in China. 
And um, Facebook isn't operating in China. They have substitutes for that. And that's why it was so easy for them to shield their market. And they just said, okay, we're going to do the app. And it's very much um, government controlled. And um, that's why it's very centralized and it works in that regard. And people just adapted because they didn't have anything else. They didn't have um, sure. an open market where they could just could choose, for example. And I think the mm -hmm. best approach is to go um, the route of a highly specialized app. For example, um, to build it up at first. Um, for example, Be Real. Maybe you have heard um, of the app. Um, I don't know. It's very popular amongst uh, younger people, like 16 to uh, 22 and stuff like that. Um, Never heard of it. Yeah. Um, Gali, for example, uses it also. Um, from hyperchange and um, it's highly specialized. You you have to p uh, you can post a photo, very authentic. It's just about what you're doing right now. Like you have two minutes time to snap a picture. It snaps your face picture and the other camera as well. What you're doing right now, and oh. you don't have to. It, it's the anti Instagram. It's it's no filters, nothing. Just okay. I'm sitting here and waiting at the doctors, for example, and you write something and then you re react. And this app gained so much popularity because it was so simple and so limited. It's so so amongst young people. I have to add that. That's the target audience also. So they start to build an app this way. Twitter is already established. So first of all, they have two problems. They also have some kind of a legacy problematic, like we see in the um, EV space, for example, where Tesla is ahead of the game. But now Twitter has to shift their operations and their services and stuff. And people that are established inside of the space and, and, and are used to that have now problems to shift. People don't like change as much. It depends. Creative people tend to like change more, but there are also conservative people and many people don't like changing. Oh, where's the button gone? What's happening right now? Stuff like that. And I think it's a harder problem to solve than just an engineering problem. It is a human engineering problem also. You have to look at how human behavior is. Um, you have the unique um, thing that tw uh, Elon Musk running Twitter is also already problematic in that sense that people who, don't, who despise Elon Musk, oh, I don't trust this guy. Why should I pay with Twitter now? I don't know if many people would do it then. The, uh, I think the you don't people have to pay though. Yeah, no, no. I mean, um, he wants to add payment uh, payment system, it's the everything app. Oh, that, I see. This the wallet, vision you mean. for his vision. I think yeah, yeah. for his vision, it's a okay. little bit more complicated than that. And I think it will take eventually more time than he thinks, a lot more time because people won't just jump on into it. And before that, he has to stabilize Twitter so hard because now they're burning cash, and that's pretty dangerous. What's happening? And um, yeah. This radical approach, the g g like going forward, I, I like that he is so vocal and verbal and open about the process. But this also starts chaos, for example, with the blue check mark, because he, we, we are right in the process, like we are in the code right now uh, while we're using You know it. what's funny about yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything you're saying, like your German is showing so hard right now, bro. <laughs> like it's, it's so funny oh God, my German. because it's like... <laughs> Because I, I totally I totally get what you're saying, mm -hmm. but the the way I view it, I I would flip it on its head. I would mm -hmm. say that the net number of people that are going to find the the changes and the improvements and the advancements and the sort of chaos nature of the of the software in the next like say one to three years is going to be much larger. Like those people that find that to be good and they want to be part of that is going to be much larger mm -hmm. than the people that are going to be turned off by it. Because as long as the overarching principle of is this better than anything else you have out there yeah. is secured, you're done. Yeah, you're done. I get you're not going to make everybody happy. You know, you're not going to make everybody happy. And the other part of this, too, is that Twitter, in the end, is a platform that can be theoretically used by anybody with an Internet connection. So this is billions of people. This is not a U.S. centric thing. This is not a. Uh, it's like a specific country thing. This is a people thing. And so if you put it through that lens and you say, okay, what's the percentage of people that have uh, internet today? Is uh, probably, like, probably like 3 billion people. Or four, say, let's say half the world has access to internet that where Twitter can operate. Excuse me. <clears throat> say that's 4 billion people. Um, if 20% of those people, uh, we expect them to have access to Twitter, that's 
800 million people on the platform. That's a 4X from where it is now. They might lose like say 10 or 20 million that are in that framework of, okay, this chaos is not like, mm -hmm. I'm not okay with this. This is kind of driving me nuts. But if it's something that they have fun doing, if it's going to give them content that they're looking for, if it's as a creator, something that you find that's going to make you a lot of money and you can, you can make uh, a living off of it, these are, again, I think these are very solvable problems. And, and it's not, if people find something that, <laughs> that they like, like we look at Tesla as an example. Tesla is such a good example for this. And a lot of people say like, don't use Tesla and Twitter or two different things. It's not though. One is a, is a physical product. The other one is a digital product, but they're products nonetheless. You know, people buy clothes in real life. People buy clothes for their freaking character on Fortnite. Okay. People buy things that they find that they enjoy and people use things that bring them joy, either digitally or physically. And Elon and his teams have a track record of creating things that people really enjoy. And from a software perspective, software is way easier. It's way easier to program or, or, to, or to create and change than physical things. So you think about a car as an example. A car, you have to build an entire supply yep. chain. You yep. have to uh, source all the parts. You have to create a production line. You have to go through the testing phase. You got to iterate on it. And that's it also takes, a uh, point. 18 to 24 months. Sorry, I have to yeah. add something right there. Please. And that's also the advantage Tesla has because they have the software um, in-house and expertise so with such a big yeah. expertise that they change your car with an update. That's that's I, I get your point because that's mind blowing. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And then so so like the way Twitter is gonna change for the better, like if they do something <coughs> wrong, it's gonna get changed and it's gonna get better and better and better. There is no culture. I think the biggest thing that happens with these, like say your Google and your Facebooks that are all software. They're all software. Your whatever social media company X, Instagram, TikTok, whatever you want to call it, these are all softwares. But the reason they don't change is because there's a culture in the in the company that says, "Oh, like we shouldn't mess with what works. We shouldn't do something that 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 is going to break this in some way. Like it's mm -hmm. risky for us to make this change." The culture that Elon's companies have is like, "I don't care." Like we are trying to get to the best possible solution. So even though one day you might have a thing what, that might piss off or make people very uncomfortable in the same way you it. described, in a couple months it's changed because of software. It, that's how it works. So that's why I think Twitter is going to be extremely successful. It's going to be without a doubt in my heart, and I could be 100% wrong, but it's going to be the social media platform of the world in the next three or five years. I have zero doubts. I have zero doubts. The, 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 the problem solving staff that's going to be at that company building that thing mm -hmm. is going to be second to none. And there's not going to be a culture of, hey, let's just sit here and let's not break it because we don't want to mess with our numbers. That doesn't happen with, with, with the companies that he runs. Now, is it going to, again, is it going to be chaotic and messy and weird? And is it going to be very easy for people to attack how he does it? Of course. Of course it is. But guess what? That's great for those media companies because now you're giving them something to talk about. So it's like it's like it's like a weird like um like we're at the point now where I really don't think public opinion can can uh derail Elon. I really don't think so. I mm -hmm. think we're way way past that yeah. point. He's got way too much money. Tesla's making way too much money. It's way too much of a superior product with versus everything else. And all he has to do, like he has all the time in the world. This is what it really comes down to. Like making things is a is a function of time. And if you have all the time in the world because you have all the money in the world, then you literally can do whatever you want. And if your guiding principle is make something as good as humanly possible, you will win because you have all the time in the world. You know, it's not like you're not going to run into a risk thing where you're going to do something that's going to be like too catastrophic. I don't think that that's possible in this case. Like he's going to have missteps. And then they're going to get corrected. And then the product's going to be so well beyond everything else that people are going to be like, yeah, I have no uh, no point then to use it. Dude, Amazon is the perfect example of this. Use Amazon as a as a, as a parallel for this. Amazon, do, does it, do they operate in Germany? Or is it just yeah, in the US? Yeah, of course. Or in uh, countries? It's very right? global, it's, except for Switzerland. It's They operate in, in the okay. whole Europe. Everybody hates Jeff Bezos. Like, nobody likes Jeff Bezos. Are you going to stop using Amazon? Yeah, and I get your point because the service, it, yeah, like it's uh, one day it's delivery good. and stuff like that. Yeah, that's such an advantage. That's why you. It's too good. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, I also agree to some points you've said 
or most of the points you've said, but for me, it's still, I'm very skeptical with the adop adoption. The, the, the good thing is we have data on that eventually because you have user numbers. Yeah, the bot's going to get crushed, hopefully. And uh, then you have real user numbers someday and then you can start to compare it. Oh, we did this and then this happened. And then we did this and then this happened. And now we are uh, like... Are we gaining subscribers? Are we gaining people who use the platform or not? And so that can be analyzed at one day, uh, one 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 time right now and uh, further uh, going forward. But um, yeah, the, I I don't know if it's as easy just because you have a great app that has super powerful functionalities and can do many things that um, other apps can't do doesn't mean that people will suddenly adapt it and use it. I think that's a way harder problem to solve to get people to use your service. Because you can have everything, but why should you use it? I have substitutes for communication. I use WhatsApp, for example, or I use Telegram, or I use uh, like different apps for my needs. And I get your point that, that yeah, a centralized system can also be have, uh, have advantages and stuff. And it's all about the ecosystem. And if it's integrated, for example, with, with the Tesla car software a little bit, so you have like more options and everything gets more morphed into one huge thing. Uh, I get that they could do it, but I'm like, I'm very cautious about this in the sense that this is such a, exponentially hard a harder problem nearly to solve I, I get it's just software but human behavior is let so complicated that ah it's very yeah. hard I, I don't know i don't let know. me ask you a question so so what percentage of the population do you think fits that bill where they're not going to use twitter regardless of how good it is like what what percentage of population is that you think just spitball i don't know maybe 70 percent yeah. Wow, you think it's that yeah. high? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, because, yeah. I don't know how... how so the, what uh, is it about a human? Yeah, so what is it about a human that would... Like, what is it? Is it just... Uh, is it really... A, is it a personal thing? Is it like Elon's a bad person, so I'm not going to use Twitter? Or Elon is a crazy person, I'm not going to use Twitter? Or I just like Facebook, so screw Twitter? Like, how, how um, do you think about that? Uh, the, uh, this topic is um, very complicated because the different markets operate so differently. For example, in the US, it's um, it's about what is installed on your phone. That's what's being used. That's a huge thing with the social media companies. That, oh, I need to get my app onto the default. For example, on Android or Samsung puts all, all their apps on that. They um, That's why um, in America, uh, in the US, it's, it's um, more um, broad that you use the the just the messenger app from your iPhone um, and the blue check and the green check thing is just a thing in America. That's not a thing in Europe, for example. We use WhatsApp, for example, or Telegram. We don't even use the normal messaging app from the iPhone, for example, because different apps established there and as a substitute because, um, yeah, we are like, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's that way. That That's that's why the market's a little bit um, different. That's why it's, ha it's so hard to analyze it. But what we... What we need to look at is the uh, use uh, the user number, for example, of Twitter in the US, in Europe, and stuff like that, and see how much percent of the population uses Twitter at first, because it's very they, little. Yeah, and that's what I mean. That, that's what I mean. Like, like just twenty percent are using, or t maybe ten percent is the market, or something like that. But who uses well, that's Facebook? Twitter Facebook sucks. is like. <laughs> Yeah, Facebook has has a huge <laughs> base, like very huge base, even if they, they decline and stuff like that. Um, and I think specialization is still a thing. I think the younger people won't use stuff where their grandparents are starting to show up. That's why they're going to shift to another app then. Um, that's a whole different story. But they are the older people from the future. So <laughs> that means they need to get onto the bandwagon at some point. So, so that's what I mean. It's very highly it's a highly competitive mm -hmm. market. It's highly spe it, like it's very complicated to to get people to subscribe to your app or or to your service that you use. I think it's a but 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 if a social media company could do it, then it would be Twitter because they are already established. Rumble, for example, has a huge problem. People that are not allowed on YouTube anymore 
because they are censored, go to Rumble. Now you have right-wing conservatives there. Do I want to add my content there? Mm, I'm a little bit hesitant about that because I don't, because it's the platform is overwhelmed by this um, target audience that I need to cater to if I want to be successful on Rumble. So that means my content needs to be maybe shifted a little bit more conservative or s something. For example, just just something like that. And yeah. um, this app has this stigma for the rest of the days. Uh, it's it's hard to get uh, to 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 shift that. For example. Or also the 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 all the social media platforms that are um like, yeah, in, th in that direction that that were a substitute for people that got banned, which is ridiculous to ban all the people from all the uh, social media platforms. Uh, highly against that. Um, I'm a, I'm for uh, civil discourse where you can change your uh, opinions and stuff like that. Um, but so I guess yeah. my question is: Do you think Twitter? Do you think Twitter is going to cater too much to one side of the argument? Is that sort of what you're saying here? I, I, maybe you've lost me a little bit like why why do you think so like why do you think twitter specifically is going to have like i get the young one i get like when you yep. say like hey like young kids are going to like 16 to 22 year olds they're going to jump from tiktok to snapchat yep. to be real to hello kitty i don't freaking <laughs> yeah, know like yeah, yeah. you know come up with a with a social media platform right yep. i get that but what is that that's a that's a that's a software problem what how do you like in my head the way i think about that is like okay yeah it's trendy as well but if you have, like, what's stopping Twitter from creating an algorithm that is going to be super good at catering to each of each person, sort of like what they want to see? Like, Twitter could be like, you know, again, it's software. And I guess there is some sort of branding thing too to it. I, 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 th I recognize that for sure. But I, I guess part of my gut tells me that the, the product that, Twitter is going to have is going to be so far superior to everybody mm -hmm. else that it's going to be very, very difficult to um, deny that. And yeah, you might have kids that are going to jump ship from one software to another, but the way that they're going to iterate on that over time is not going to stop. So, so what's why? Why did people jump ship from Snapchat to say um, uh, TikTok? Because it, the way I've studied the problem is that TikTok. Uh, the creator tools are just so much better. Mm -hmm. And you're able to create content that people love yeah. uh, in Tech Talk. What was, what was keeping Snapchat from doing that? They decided yeah. not to. That's yeah. what it really comes down to because it's just code. Mm -hmm. It's code. And I'm, I'm not a software engineer. I'm not going to sit down and hear, see here and tell you that I can program TikTok. No. Fuck no, I can't. Apologies for my French. But I can't. You know? Or I guess German because I guess it is a derivative of a, of a, of a German word. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> It's, but you know what I'm saying, right? So I think that that uh, problem is going to get turned upside down. That that's how I'm thinking about this thing. Is like the the natural um, inclinations that we have to give too much credit to the existing dynamics mm -hmm. is going to turn upside down, and that's what was done with SpaceX, with reusable rockets. That's what was done with Tesla, with an electric vehicle. And it's going to continue being so with Twitter, with a social media platform. This is this is the uh, industrial genius of an Elon Musk and the teams that he puts together. It's that equation gets completely turned upside down, mm -hmm. and I just don't I, I don't see why that wouldn't apply to this arena. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, I I get your points, and also I think this is the case in that sense. If you have the tools, new tools, uh, better software or better. Um, um, segments of twitter for example spaces is just a great thing i mean it's more or less a clone of of um of of uh, clubhouse for example but but this works i i've used it very much i love the discussions it's it's it just works it, it was a great feature um th a few things could be improved maybe but um i see that there is a chance there i i don't i'm not saying that there is no chance but i what i want to emphasize is the you have to be such a friggin' genius mind of human engineering to tackle this huge problem. Maybe we need five of those Elon Musk experts in the human-centered design space. That's what I mean. Elon is an engineer. I get. I get that. You'll find them. It's. It's. Yeah. I. I hope so. I hope so. Um. But. But that's what I mean. Um. It's. It's. Um. It's. I, I'm That's, just. I, I just want to emphasize how hard, how friggin' hard this problem is. It's, yeah. Yeah. For it, sure. Because human behavior, to to uh, 
the also the 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 research on h- how to manipulate human behavior or uh, uh, like uh, change human behavior. It's the whole field. It's very complicated. It's very um, cr- like if 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 people had the solution, then it was would be so easy to to oh I have a new app here it is and wow it's working right away and stuff like that. That's not how it works and. Also, um, for example, but it kind of does yeah. until it doesn't, though. That's the yeah, problem, though, right? I, it kind of does until I know. it doesn't. I know what you mean. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that's how Elon that's has why people jump shit from social of, media yeah. to social media. Elon has yeah. a track record of you making know? good products. I, I get it, and I th- I believe that if somebody can tackle the social media space, it should be Elon at least to try, at least to try it, because mm-hmm. uh, yeah, we have to see how it develops, and I hope it develops great, and I. Th- also think that um, that this can be pretty good and uh, I think he has the knowledge base to to do so but but I want just want to emphasize how hard this problem is and um, I think I'm a little bit more yeah. conservative on how much goals he will achieve with that and I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical but um, the Good. I don't know if he if he burns through the cash before that and stuff like that. I don't really know what what will happen, but I hope not. And I don't think I that mean, will happen. Yeah, um, no way. Yeah, but Dude, he's uh, got too much money. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I think. Yeah, that's great. I think your points are extremely valid. Like 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 point well taken. Super valid. Um, yeah, I just the his ability to build teams can't be underestimated yeah. either. Yeah, so even right. though that's not something that he can solve. He taps people that can, you know, SpaceX, Tesla, every other thing he started. These aren't an individual. He gets too much credit, to be completely honest. I think Elon sometimes gets way too much credit. Well, he doesn't get like as a, as an individual problem solver. I don't think he gets enough credit as a team builder and a delegator mm-hmm. and uh, to put people in the right spots to succeed. A a electric vehicle manufacturer that's going to manufacture 20 million cars per year does not operate with one person. That person mm. has basically no influence outside of like guiding the ship. And you just can't. It's too damn yeah. big. And that's, I think right now we're in that phase of Tesla now where it's so, uh, it's so incredibly, probably, I really think it's very self sustaining to the point that its success is completely, especially from the vehicle market perspective, it's, it's essentially as close to secure as you can get in this stage of the company's life. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything can happen really to derail it. There's way too much momentum. Uh, And that's why the company has refocused itself away from the cars and they're going to full self-driving and AI because that's the next stage of the company. But is Elon Musk a robotics expert? Doesn't seem like it. Uh, Is he a software expert? Yeah, you know, he started with PayPal. Mm-hmm. So and he's you know he was in front of a computer his whole life so he knows how to code okay cool so I see that there but he's no one's ever solved full self driving before and it's gonna get solved and all these you know you you keep going down the line and the human behavioral aspect yes we are emotional we are uh, fickle human beings we just talk, we kicked off the 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 podcast by saying how we're so weird <laughs> completely agree yeah. but I think a undeniable product and an undeniable service will be undeniable to the majority because the majority will do things that make them happy and Mm -hmm. if something makes you happy you will you will use it eventually and if you don't use it at some point everyone else around you is going to use it and then you make a decision a are you going to be that stubborn guy or girl who just doesn't want to get on that train, which you have every right to do, fine. Or you could be like, okay, I see why it's better. And then it shifts. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch how it plays out. It, it, the, the beautiful thing behind the, the, the growth of Twitter is that it's it's the one of the smallest, if not the smallest social media, like large social media company that's there. You know, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, all these other ones are way, way larger. Um, so Twitter has a lot of room to grow. Yeah. And once they create That's those right. creator tools that it's going to incentivize creators to go there and start creating content and make money and make a living out of creating content, it's going to change the game entirely. I wouldn't be surprised if Twitter has a billion users by the end of next year, to be completely honest. Yeah, that'd be... <laughs> I would not be surprised. I would be very surprised, be surprised if that happens. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah, be at all. crazy. Yeah, I get, I get your points. I mean, yeah. f- for example, Facebook also tried it. Like they try to have a Facebook OS and stuff like that. Please use just our services, our stuff. For example, the Everything app. They also tried that, but it didn't work out that as much. And the metaverse is they also have the culture. It's also uh, like 
like a hard, it was a totally hard sh shift now. And now we are in a phase where the, all these social media companies really have a existential crisis right now because I think they've squeezed, uh, squeezed every penny of their business model out that they could um, for the last 10 years. And they had a steady grow growth, for example. Also, YouTube, for example, shifting to, to um, shorts, try to establish a TikTok competitor and stuff like that. They're always trying to, to get the next big thing. And um, yeah, it's, it, it will be very interesting to see what will happen with Twitter. And do you think that the that Twitter, because of the Twitter overhang, um, I want to talk about that now. Uh, do you think that Twitter, Twitter really overhang? is a huge factor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, don't. don't uh, I should have worn my Twitter overhang shirt. Yeah, it, Where's Gary? Oh my God, Gary, what's no, up? <laughs> and not even that, maybe Warren Redlich is somewhere around the corner. You have to be careful now. Oh, goodness. Please, <laughs> please no. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, but. I don't want to fight in my studio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that the um, Twitter overhang is is a thing? Do you think Tesla is influenced by the Twitter problematic that we are seeing and the public opinion around Twitter? And does it spill over to Tesla and it gets all dirty, uh, in, covered in 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 mistrust and uh, yeah and stuff like that? I think there's some. There's definitely some. I don't think it's that big, but it's definitely part of the discussion and it's a fascinating thing to talk about because. It's like human behavior in markets, you know, human behavior yeah. and perception in markets, mistrust in markets. So when um, Elon went out on Twitter and said, you know, he, when there was news that he sold another tranche and then back in August, he said he wasn't going to sell anymore. Uh, a lot of people, myself included, was like, what the, f what happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happened? Started getting texts from, um, you know, and again, I, I recognize that that, con that, that, sentence of no i'm not going to sell anymore or i'm done selling was done likely within the context of that period of time to secure of the course. future of twitter it doesn't imply that it's for the future obviously i wouldn't expect this guy to never sell shares ever again yeah however totally. the communication is very important because now if people perceive that as yes you're done selling and then a few months later you sell then you're like what the hell happened what happened Right, like this is crazy. Like you said, you weren't going to sell, so mistrust begun, begins to sip, seep in. And that I made comments around that. You know, human behavior is going to be there's going to be mistrust, and you're going to have a problem with it. And my recommendation was mention why you sold this time, and then never mention it ever again. Just sell whenever you want. Obviously, you have every right to sell your stock, and you you will mitigate this mistrust variable that uh, is tied to that sort of behavior. Obviously, he didn't say anything. He has every right to not say anything. Um, it's his shares. He deserves every single share he has. The dude has built the freaking company from scratch. So um, I, that's not at all what I'm what I'm criticizing here. What I'm criticizing here is the is the, the variable of mistrust that could be um, applied if you're not clear or you overshare in your intentions too much. Um, so... I think there's some of that for sure. And you can see it in some analysts, you know. I, I think Dan Ives has grown quite tired <laughs> of, of that sort of behavior. Uh, he's one of the analysts that's covering Tesla. Fellow Penn State alum, by the way. We are Penn State. Okay. Uh, him and I went to the same college. Dan Ives, I got to have you on my channel one of these days. We talked before. I got to have you on. Um, but I think I think it's legitimate. Now, there, the, the question is, what I've been getting a lot of in my DMs and stuff is like people are... Like, wh why are these guys? Why are these guys feeding the narrative of this Twitter overhang? Why are they feeding the narrative of these things that are happening? You know, um, I think the it's not really so much that the narrative narrative is being fed, is that there is a segment of the population that feels like this Twitter thing is causing some uh, complications, mm -hmm. and I can see why because. Like you said, we're human. We're, we're fickle uh, things, you know. We're humans. We're emotional. Um, but I think it's the minority. I really think it's the minority of the story. The more I sat down, I'm like, okay. Ultimately, what's happening here with Tesla is that the company is going to make a gigantic amount of money. It, it it already has, and it's going to continue to do so. It's going to continue to grow. the The growth of that company is uh, separate from whatever's happening with Twitter. Because let's be honest. We are the only ones that are super f following this thing super close. Most people don't give a shit. Most yeah. people will buy the thing that they feel is going to be the best bang for their buck. 
and Teslas, especially in this uh, next generation of, of, of vehicle that we're getting with the electric vehicles and the amount of government incentives that are surrounding this industry, it's going to be one of, if not the no brainer purchase for that next generation of transport, especially when full self-driving gets solved. So that's that's the variable that's going to carry it through. And that will start to speak for itself much louder than it has been in the past. What's interesting to think about is that for so long, the Tesla story has been incredibly dependent on the story. The Elon the Musk is a the, genius. Yeah. The narrative, right? Like best car ever, super passionate community. We must protect it at all costs. Like all of us are like, it's our baby. Like yeah. we love it so what much. Panel we can't let it I die. haven't seen panel away. gaps and stuff like that. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah exactly. Very it, strong community. Exactly, that, you know, yeah. mm. very strong, and it's and it deserves it because it has a great product, it has a great leader, and the people are very passionate about it. But now we we are into the next stage of Tesla, which is like okay, listen, like they don't need the help, <laughs> they got everything they need, mm -hmm. and they're going to continue down that route. So the individualism of Elon and how he approaches things and what he does are going to be, I think, less and less impactful over time. They are going to generate uh, a lot of hesitancy from, like, say, big funds for sure in the near term. But the longer term you go out into the future, you can't the deny less the success. becomes yeah. a problem. Can't yeah, because it, it, it will not stop the success. I really don't think so. Um, yeah, for a period of yeah. time, I did. But mm -hmm. then I sit down, I'm like, okay, it really comes down to bang for your buck. All of us are way too engaged in this, uh, <laughs> not not too engaged, but we just love the story so much we can't stop sort of engaging with it. But that's not how most people are. So, you know, I'd yep. love to be proven either right or wrong in this. But yeah, what, what do you I, think? I think um, Ross, Ross Gerber also um, talked about it a lot of times, as I recall, that... Um, He thinks, um, yeah, Elon shouldn't be or, or doesn't need to be CEO of Tesla, for example, anymore. And I think we are here in a um, critical step. He is now focused on Twitter a little bit. He's sleeping there until things are moving forward. Then he's going to go back. And um, he also still is managing all these companies at the same time, still doing that no deny there and he still has to put out fires everywhere i think he might have 16 phones or something like that i don't know uh but <laughs> He's got burner phones everywhere but, <laughs> yeah, i gotta hear it uh no uh, but but i think it's a good most time. people got side like a lot of guys have side girls this guy's got side businesses yes yeah, <laughs> yeah it is and and People from the Tesla <laughs> side are very jealous on Twitter right now. He, oh, Twitter gets so much attention right now. Are you kidding me, Elon? Come back home to your home base, Tesla and SpaceX, please. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. he already has so a, 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 a polyamorous relationship with Tesla and yeah. SpaceX. Why Businesses, should he give bro. that up It's for hilarious. Twitter? Come on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. That's uh, the right. comparison that... <laughs> I think that's also something that is happening. People are jealous on Twitter, like, oh, yeah. we need you here, please. But uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's it's a critical point for Tesla to show we don't need Elon Musk, more or less. You know what I mean? Like like to show we are functional without Elon. Do you see that? And even if he comes back, okay, great, right. you're gonna work uh, again on on Tesla full time, or I don't know, or part time, or allocates more time to Tesla again when it's needed um but i think that's a good thing and i think people are also a little bit um over dramatic in the tesla space now because they are like you said so used to this narrative of this company that s just uh changed everything the path for accelerating the the world to um um sustainable so energy okay. and on, this young, mission anyway. and and they already did that And or or they they are on the best yeah. path to do that still, and and they they shifted the whole segment, the whole market. And I also analyzed all the German companies, as you know. And um, like my conclusion till now is, the German automotive sector is effed, <laughs> to say it politely, because they have the problem to shift a huge slow tra a train or, or or ship. I mean ship. And they, yeah, they, they will have so hard problems to shift to that. A friend of mine who's very near, who I'm going to interview soon, 
uh, who's very near the automotive sector, said that Mercedes, BMW and VW announced that they won't focus on the mass market anymore. Just the luxury segment. I don't know if, if VW was in that, but I know that BMW wow. and Mercedes are just focusing on the luxury segment. I mean, they I already tell did. tell you everything you need to know. Yeah, they don't get into the mass market. And they acknowledge that they lost to Tesla already. You can see the cracks crumbling now. It's very near that we will see that until 2025. The nearer we get to 2030, we're going to see the facade uh, breaking down because um, Mercedes, of course, they are luxury brand, but they don't sell any uh, small cars anymore. Just the big ones, the 150,000 euro things or big limousines, for example, the S-Class and the Maybachs, for example. And also BMW just focuses yeah. on that segment. And yeah, they... Yeah, they don't focus on the mass market. They lost the mass market to Tesla already. <laughs> and they didn't, didn't even ramp up already. And that's crazy. And BYD because, and, yeah. and whoever else decides to uh, enter and those the markets. Chinese right? companies, so of it's course, be, the Chinese companies, of course. Yeah, yeah we don't have yeah. to forget this those. Is, yeah. But that's this big is news. such yeah. a huge parallel to um, so many different things in, in, in technology and in industry that has happened over and over again where the dominant players get supplanted by the newcomers when they have a giant shift in technology and a culture to push that forward. The Innovator's Dilemma, one of the best books I've ever read. I forget the guy's, uh, the, the author's name. I recommend everybody reads that book. And it's and it's, an, it's a reminder, constant reminder that just because you've been great at what you do doesn't mean you're going to continue to be great at what you do. And the fact that BMW, Mercedes, and Volkswagen are already shifting gears and openly saying that they're going to be more focused on the luxury means that they know that they cannot compete in the smaller vehicles because they're not going to make any money on it or they don't have the technology and know-how to know how to make money on it, especially when you run a risk that if it's not the great a great car, you are totally screwed because you've built an entire supply chain with millions and millions of parts that are you're going to be stuck with. Mm -hmm. That's literally the worst possible scenario here. So Clayton um, M. Christensen is the name of the invader, Inventor's Dilemma, the book. Clayton M. Christensen, oh, oh, the author. That we've he heard the name, so you can look it up. I'm going to add some links yep. in the description too. But uh, please go on, Farzad, yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah, so the the, the fact that those, those cracks are already showing is... is uh, Oh, man, how many how <laughs> how loud has the Tesla community has has been about this sort of value of death that keeps being brought up over and over again? Um, the slowest train wreck in history, yeah. right? There's so many different like superlatives that have been thrown around for this thing, and um, yeah, it's it's just going to be brutal. It's going to be brutal. I think it the the shock is going to come from the standpoint of I don't think the broader public is prepared to absorb what's about to happen because what naturally means when you have the Mercedes and the BMWs and the Volkswagens and the Fords and the GMs and all these other players that are going to focus mostly on the, say, low volume, high profit segment is that now you're going to have a giant lack of vehicles total. Yeah. And who are the ones that are going to be best positioned to do that, to, to take over that market are the ones with very good cost uh, leverages, very good operational leverages, very good technologies to lower costs and high volume. Oh my goodness, Tesla is very good at that. So what's going to end up happening, I think, is in the next, say, five to 10 years, Tesla started as this luxury maker, Model S, Model X. You can probably throw Cybertruck in there when it comes out, although I think yeah. it's going to be much cheaper than people might think over time so. because of how easy it is going to be to build. Yeah. But Tesla is going to be the people's car. People, Tesla is going to be Volkswagen, basically. Volkswagen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. People's car. Yeah. You know? Because they have the, they have the, the they have the operational leverage to do that. It's absolutely nuts. And uh, um, and then uh, plus yeah. other Chinese automakers. Go ahead. Yeah, of course, of course, the Chinese um, also. And I, I just wanted to add that. I even would go further. If you have a highly specialized luxury car where the electronics doesn't work, like the software is shit, <laughs> and you compare it to the mass market cars that drive themselves and stuff like that. Such a good point. And then you're like, uh, hmm, 
Mercedes used to be good, but I mean, yeah, I'm gonna buy a Tesla or the Chinese car. Oh, the Chinese car also has leather stitching and great product quality. <laughs> and Tesla has a luxury. Oops, a Tesla has a luxury car now uh, with Hans's interior design for one hundred fifty thousand US dollars. It's comparable to the Mercedes. Oh, and the suspension is great, huh? How many iterations of cars from Tesla would we need until they make like their luxury segment better? I mean, they are just a startup right. still. It's more or less they're still more or less like a startup. I mean, they already established like, like, but still like it's young. It's a very young car company. It's so crazy to to think about that. That's just because of the electric um, technology. That I mean, internal combustion engines are complicated and they are complicated to tweak and the German legacy auto companies have a lot of patents in that space. They they perfected the internal combustion engine, but now nobody uses the internal combustion engine anymore. So they're yeah. gone. It's just like, really. Um, I think they will focus on hydrogen with big trucks, and I think this hydrogen thing with big trucks makes a lot of sense. It makes sense. They can do that. Um, but if the even the Tesla Semi is more cost effective and better than the hydrogen car, uh, the hydrogen trucks, then we have another segment that is crushed by Tesla. And that's really that's crazy right. because uh, if you have a good software and your fleet management and your cost reduction, for example, oh, I can um, drive uh, four autonomous trucks in a row and stuff like that. No, uh, Nobody is close. It, it's so crazy how... how um, how far away Tesla is, you can't imagine that. And if you see the drive pilot from Mercedes where they are building like 10 years now, it's more like 10 years journey that they built these, this autonomous driving level three autonomy, 60 mile, uh, uh, 30 miles per hour uh, on a highway uh, without construction <laughs> sites with blah, blah, blah. Uh, and always connected with the internet with LiDAR scanners and a, and a, I always call it a council of sensors that decide which sensor <laughs> is right. Am I right? Am I right very this German. time? It's very German. Hey, yeah, and, yeah. and there you go. <laughs> if you, I have to emphasize something, listen to Lex Friedman's podcast with Andrew Kapathy. I'm going to um, put a link down below. I have a small cutout of that. Basically, you would think that these sensors are an asset to you, but if you fully consider the entire product in its entirety, these sensors are actually potentially a liability. These sensors aren't free. They don't just appear on your car. Suddenly you need to have an entire supply chain. You have people procuring it. Uh, there can be problems with them. They may need replacement. They are part of the manufacturing process. They can hold back the line in production. Uh, you need to source them. You need to maintain them. You have to have teams that write the firmware, all of it. And then uh, you also have to incorporate them, fuse them into the system in some way. And so it actually like bloats a lot of it. And I think Elon is really good at simplify, simplify. Best part is no part. And he always tries to throw away things that are not essential because he understands the entropy in organizations and in approach. In this case, the cost is high and you're not potentially seeing it if you're just a computer vision engineer. And I'm just trying to improve my network and, you know, is it more useful or less useful? How useful is it? And the thing is, if once you consider the full cost of a sensor, it actually is potentially a liability and you need to be really sure that it's giving you extremely useful information. In this case, we looked at using it or not using it and the delta was not massive. And these sensors, you know, they can change over time. For example, you can have one type of, say, radar, you can have other type of radar, they change over time. Now suddenly you need to worry about it. Now suddenly you have a column in your SQLite telling you, oh, what sensor type was it? And they all have different distributions. They contribute noise and entropy into everything, and they bloat stuff. I think the others, uh, some of the other uh, companies who are, that are using it are probably going to drop it. And also organizationally, it's been really fascinating to me that it can be very distracting. If you, all you want to get to work is vision, all the resources are on it, and you're building out a data engine, and you're actually making forward progress because that is the sensor with the most bandwidth, the most constraints in the world, and you're investing fully into that, and you can make that extremely good. It's so interesting what he've said about this sensor problematic because if you specialize on visual cameras just that it's so easier to maintain it's hard at first but if you solve this problem you, you don't need radar you don't need all the other sensors that's why you don't, won't have phantom braking eventually and even with the they have those small voxel stuff that um from the distance um dr noel all talked about that also and analyzed that a little bit and it's also so interesting what's happening there in the space that i mean it's crazy what those cameras can yeah. do. They're measuring photons. It's not even like just visual. It's just different beasts. It's, it's, cr it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, pl but so please wild. go ahead. I just wanted to add that. That's very important. No, you're good. No, I love that color. I appreciate that because 
what it really comes down to is that the domination of Tesla is going to be completely bananas. It's going to be stupid. It's going to be, it's going to be to the point where there might be some uh, some noise about monopolistic laws in the next yeah. five to ten years in the states mm. because it's it's going to be that outrageously uh, uh, so much so much better than whatever the competition has, uh, especially for for say the, the the near term five to ten years if that's what you want to call it. Long term, it gives more time to people to catch up. You got licensing in play. Uh, you have a completely different economy that God knows what's going to happen. We have Sandy Monroe and Jordan Gisigi on my channel on Monday. Wow. And okay. this came up as a topic of conversation. And one of the things that what was brought up that Sandy said is that he thinks that the gas car is going to re be replaced faster than horses were when the wow. vehicle was okay, first introduced. Good. Yeah. Which is, think about that. That's you know, the, the from horse to the car was like a what 10 to 15 year sort of like transition he thinks it's going to be faster than that the the collapse of the gas car cannot be understated and the ramifications from that collapse are going to be felt very strongly mm -hmm. because that's going to mean a in the same token that there's going to be a, a big lack of vehicles that are affordable in the next five to ten years there is going to be a short of, of jobs, shortage of jobs in those in that industry because it's going to take a really long time for manufacturers to catch up. And what's going to end up happening is as these manufacturers catch up, they're not going to be done with the manufacturing processes of your of you know five, 10 years ago. It's going to be done with manufacturing processes of five to 10 years into the future, which are going to be much more automated and they're going to be much more uh, um, uh, yeah, much more reliant on AI and robotics, which means that the net number of jobs that are going to exist is likely to be much less than they are now. So now you're introducing these like new things that are happening in the economy with this transition where those people now I'm going to have to find something else to do. So, and, and it's sort of analogous in my head to, so in the States, we've had this uh, issue with uh, factory work and, you know, mining and a lot of these like blue collar jobs that have yep. existed in the States that have sort of uh, been transitioned away. And one of the areas that I used to live in, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, shout out Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Woo! Yeah, yeah, 610, <laughs> represent 610-484 of the area codes. Okay. Um, the... Um, that town, that area was very blue collar. It was uh, mm -hmm. Bethlehem Steel used to exist in that area, which was the largest provider of steel in the world. One of the largest providers of steel during World War II was based out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And a lot of that industry was built around that, uh, that in that town, in yeah. that area. And over time, what has happened is you've had this sort of uh, transition away from physical and manufacturing mm -hmm. jobs, and the area has turned into this sort of logistics hub where a lot of warehouses are there and a lot of trucking and things like that. But... It, it, it there was a a gap there for like say 30 40 years where that area suffered tremendously because all those jobs left all those jobs yeah. left they went overseas they got automated they got more efficiently made uh manufacturing and automobiles is going to be very very similar and detroit has already kind of felt this already where detroit michigan was this incredible place of manufacturing and uh industry now is a shell of, of, its, of its former self because of what happened in the 2008 crisis and before that as the as the you know as Toyota took over and all of those jobs uh, moved away from from that area uh, but now it's not just going to be a specific brand or subsegment of the gas vehicle market it's going to be all gas cars all gas cars so what happened in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, what happened in Detroit, Michigan, is likely to happen in every single place that currently has a gas car manufacturer Germany. unless they figure out how to transition at the speed of light. Yeah. And that's very yeah. unlikely to happen and that's going to cause a lot of problems. And, and I have to and I have to add something there because I've um my thesis is with my channel is analyzing the German market to give this angle to the Tesla community and really what it comes down to, if you listen closely, what um, Herbert Dies was saying before he was left, <laughs> he didn't le leave. He was left. We all know that. Uh, <laughs> on the in the between reading retired. between the lines, no <laughs> official statement there. But um, he said that if we don't shift faster, and he really was verbal about that. We all know that. Uh, he said we're gonna cut like twenty percent of the jobs in Wolfsburg. Uh, going for, forward from 2030 
And yeah, the the nobody in Germany wants to hear something like that, especially not the board of the, uh, especially not the workers' council. But sorry, guys, um, I think he saw the projections because to, a few days ago, Jim Farley from Ford said that they might have to kill like 40% of the jobs in the US due to electrification because the production is easier. And listen to that. And I think Herbert Dees knew we have to triple our yeah. sales and our production to keep our staff. Mm -hmm. And that's why he said something like that with 20%. Mm -hmm. They have to let go 20%. And, and it's 20% is probably now, like the sugar-coated number. Yeah, I know? think so. I think so. It might be 40, yeah. But but it's interesting to see that that now Jim Farley is is like an American CEO. He can say that publicly. <laughs> In Germany, we are oh, it's a little bit critical. Uh, shit goes loose here if, if we cut jobs. Uh, Nobody wants to hear that, especially in the U.S. as well, of course. But uh, you can be more vocal about that or you can fire people. It's not possible in Germany to fire people so easy like in the U.S. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but yeah, I, I just wanted to add that. That's very interesting. We, we, now we see that the, really the, the, the market, the automotive sector, is, um, all their marketing mumbo jumbo is crumbling. They can't, they can't say anything. They, they start to admit. And th that means that... P uh, something that we just projected like three years ago already and we saw or, or the last at least two years uh, we, we projected that and everybody said no no oh, they are such a strong brand uh, Amer the German car companies BMW is such a good thing <laughs> and stuff like that but but now we see that that we kind of see that Herbert Dies shouldn't have been uh, let go from VW it was the biggest mistake they could do and now we have Blume who is managing Porsche and VW now, and he's for e-fuels, for example. And if they start banging the e-fuel drum again uh, for the next 10 years, then it's way too late to do something. And then electrification, and I have yeah, a, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane yeah. what's happening. And the implication for yeah. the German market is incredible. It's so dangerous what they are doing. It's so dangerous because so many jobs are dependent on that, and Germany will fall into a big hole, I think. Really, it's it's not good. It's really not good. I, I see very dark times ahead if Tesla... But, but I'm grateful that Tesla is here because then they can swoop up all the talent. Maybe they open up a plant in near Wolfsburg. <laughs> they <laughs> probably will like need that. to. That's yeah. because of the scale, right? They're going to be the only one of the few ones that can have the scale of, of these uh, affordable EVs. Yeah. It's, I, I agree with you 100%. The, the, it is a dire outlook, not just for the auto segment, but I think for global economies, I really do think this is going to be, this might be the 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 match, like the fuel that makes this uh, upcoming global recession that we're probably in already, uh, make it much more severe. And I have a lot of a lot of fears around that, because the the transportation industry is a very big part of the economy. You know, it might be single digits. But it's millions of people globally that mm -hmm. are probably tens of millions, to be honest, that are at stake of having their job v disrupted big time. And it's already happening and you can't stop it. It's too big. It's li this is literally the Titanic. Yeah. This is literally the Titanic. It's way too big to maneuver. And it's going mm -hmm. to an iceberg. Somebody has made this uh, this uh, this analogy. I'm sure a thousand times, but it's 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 very important to restate this mm -hmm. because that Titanic is the auto industry. It's not just some automakers. It's the auto industry. And if that thing sinks, that means millions of people lose their jobs. And now we're going to be in a place that the economy is going to be in a really shitty spot globally. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be uh, in in this time period that we are now, where people are becoming more um, you can see the signals everywhere. Ad spend is down. You can see it. Meta is laying off people. Google is uh, giving warnings about ad spend being down. Their quarterly report wasn't that great. You got Apple laying off workers. There's a lot of signals that are saying people are not spending as much as they used to. And when you tighten your your pockets, one of the first things that goes is that new car. Exactly. And then in that recession, when you, uh, the government's saying hey, don't buy a gas car, buy an electric car, but there's no electric cars to be found. 
no one's going to buy a freaking car. And all those people that were working at those places are not going to be there anymore because Ford and GM and Mercedes and BMW and Volkswagen are going to say, we literally don't have work for you because we can't, people aren't demanding these things. So we have to lay you off. And that's going to make the recession even worse. Yeah, I have I have fears. I have a lot of fears around that. And I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> how I can be helpful during this time. But I have, outside of sounding the alarm and sort of mm -hmm. having this yeah. conversation openly with you, uh, and who, you know, we're, just, we're two random guys on the internet. Who the <laughs> fuck's going to listen to this? Yeah. You know, who, we're no experts in this, obviously, mm -hmm. but it seems obvious. Yeah. It seems obvious. And um, I think it's hard to, unless you move your focus towards that world and take in the signals and really take in what's happening. And given that the previous track record of governments and industries again and again shows that they're very slow and they're not willing to think about the future too much, but much more about the present and the past, then it's a recipe for disaster. And it's gonna allow new players that have never existed to come in and gobble up that market share, which might give prominence to countries or companies where some people might think they don't, they would rather not. So like, for example, the Chinese, the super obvious thing that's gonna happen here is that China is gonna become a giant player in the auto manufacturing business in the next 10 to 20 years. That is without a doubt that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. uh, does the US want that? Does Germany want that? You know, do, do, do they have a choice? Companies that, do they have a choice? Exactly. Uh, where's the supply chain housed? Mostly in China. This is the recipe for, for what's gonna happen in the next 10 to 20 years. And, what are those nation states doing about it? It's up to them, you know, but it's coming. And an individual like you or I, or whoever's listening to this, I think it's important to think through that and, and, and decide what you want for yourself, because that very much could impact your life's trajectory in 10 to 20 years. I'm not saying uh, a Chinese auto company is going to ruin your life. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is if you're thinking about building a career in the auto manufacturing business and you're thinking about partnering with Volkswagen and Ford and GM and all these other companies or these suppliers, or you're thinking about what do I want to do with my life? Where can I uh, capitalize on opportunities? This is going to be a giant variable in that decision. It's going to be part of that. It, it should be part of your way of thinking about the future. Um, I don't know, man. It, it, there's a lot of signs that say we're going to be, it's going to be freaking weird in the mm -hmm. next two to three years. And it's, yeah, some but, companies are going to be very well positioned like Tesla, but boy, it's yeah. going to be, it's going to get ugly. I, but I also think um, what's important to note here is that even, especially because we are heading to those uh, like disruptive, n more disruptive times than we already been through. Um, that you have to look at the companies that may succeed in the future of that, which company is in the yes. pole position, which company can go through this crisis. And I would say it is Tesla. I would say, uh, yeah, the stock price is still undervalued. It could, even if it's slashed in half now, from the point on now, they will be the winners when the markets recover on the at the end of the tunnel right. for example because if That's they right. figure out how to produce a 20000 euro car or um a, a efficient one then it's tesla they still have their contracts with with all those uh, suppliers it's also a supplier game now uh, who has the most lithium laying around and producing batteries and they integrate everything they know something about battery production they bought up many startups to to uh, get into this position to producing batteries they buy every battery they get their fingers on from Panasonic. So the contract volume of Tesla is so big that, yeah, it's already a monopole, more or less, I would say. Like, it's it's way before that because uh, in the end, it's how much batteries do you have? That's the capacity, how, how much cars you can produce. And if VW doesn't have contracts with lithium mining companies and joint ventures with Chinese battery producers and stuff like that, for example, then... And the Chinese will use their batteries for their uh, cars that they can sell directly to Europe. Why should they go the route through VW? Why should uh, BYD sell their battery packs to VW when they just can use them themselves to market directly to the German customer? Maybe it's just because of the brand. Then the Chinese companies may buy more German brands. Like Volvo, for example, was is this, um, 
Swedish brand or Danish brand. I'm sorry yeah. if, no, um, if I'm wrong. Uh, um, was it Swedish? Oh my God, Volvo is Swedish, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I think it's Swedish. Yeah. Why am I blanking on this? I'm pretty yeah, sure but, Swedish. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, Lars would know it. He's from Denmark, uh, so he's nearer to those countries. So it's I'm definitely not Danish. No, it's not. I'm pretty Danish. sure it's Swedish. Yeah, I know it's Swedish. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it, it should be Swedish. Yeah. I think so. Um, but, but what Sorry, I mean Lars. is, yeah, the, the, <laughs> yeah uh, we all mix. I'm, I always mix up all these countries <laughs> in the north. It's <laughs> horrible. But uh, yeah. Um, what I mean is that they just buy, um, or for example, MG was also bought. The brand MG, like is an English company the, or an English brand, they made roadsters and stuff like that, and they were bought out from a Chinese company. And now they sell MGs mm -hmm. in Europe, and it's a European brand, and that's the best strategy they can do. It's hard to market their new uh, Yungling cars and uh, with the Chinese names. It's hard to market them in Europe. Because we don't know them. Like, what, what is that? What what kind of brand is that? I don't know this. I know MG. Oh, yeah, from the past. I know MG. I know Volvo. Yeah. I know Polestar now because, yeah. Yeah, that's just I wanted to add. I mean, BYD is also a good choice, I think. They will be pre prevail, I think. Yeah, you have to look at the markets and decide what also what financial decisions you, you're going to do because this will be relevant for the next few years. No financial Super. advice, by the way. Everybody does what, what they think that it's the best, but um, me personally... We're probably the last people you want to listen to Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to financial advice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we need someone like Ross yeah. Gerber or, or Gary Black or, so, or yeah. Alexander Mertz to talk on that. Someone who actually knows what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not in the financial segment either, but but yeah, but that's what I'm going to do. I, I see a view, the Tesla stock price now as a, as a big Black Friday sale, and I hope I scoop every yeah. last penny and put it in. Um, that Because inflation is 10% in Germany, should I lay it, let it lay around? Uh, cash flow is tight still, but yeah, but still, um, that's yeah, what I'm gonna do. I don't know. That's the one thing. I'll tell you what, man. That one of the lessons I made a video last week about. Uh, I was trying to be very vulnerable and honest about my my situation right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've, I'm super lucky to have what I have. Uh, my wife and I have a very secure life. Okay, mm -hmm. but my uh, cash flow is not allowing me to buy more Tesla stock. And I'm me like, too. Yeah, crap. Yeah. You know, like it's it's such a bummer. Uh not financial advice. I'm making this for my own decision. So I learned a lot of lessons during during that. I'm like, okay, cool. Very good. You have a lifestyle you want to live. And uh, but guess what? There will always be opportunities. And you can't put yourself in a situation where you can't capitalize on opportunities because there's nothing I hate more than not being able to capitalize on an opportunity. That's how futures are built. Mm -hmm. That's how security is formed. And it was a big learning lesson for me. Big learning lesson for me. So now I'm thinking of ways of like, how do, how do I increase my shovel? How do I make my shovel bigger? How do I increase my income stream? So on and so forth. So, um, you know, this merch line, I'm gonna yeah, plug it. Is it okay if I yeah, plug it on your channel? Yeah, now I, I just <laughs> wanted to say that now's the time for the merch line. And uh, tell us about your merch <laughs> where we add it now. Farzad's new no, merch line. I don't, beautiful I garments. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is one of the old hoodies, but like I'm, I'm trying to create merch that's like super... That's like legitimately its own fashion line. I, yeah. I don't want. I don't. Yeah. I don't want it to just be something that's like, "Hey, buy my stuff because you want to support me," which of <laughs> course I appreciate. My goodness, who wouldn't? But I also want to make something that stands on its own, that you're proud to wear, that you love, you know. And it's like sourcing really high quality materials, making the designs as cool as freaking possible. You know, like the, the the overarching thought about the the merch line is it's the robots are coming. That's that's so that's the tag. The robots are coming. And I created a trailer for it and everything, like a, like a two-minute trailer, uh, and I pieced together some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some B-roll from Canva and whatever. But I, I really wanted to convey a story of like, hey, as the age of automation and robots comes through, it could either be the best thing ever or the potentially something that's very Downfall, damaging yeah. because you, you don't want something like it displaces every job we've ever had and we don't have a way to really uh, create the next generation of the economy. Uh, we want it to be something that's super complementary to the human condition. And the thought process behind the, the the fashion line I'm creating is like, how do, I, how do we create awareness about where we're going? How do we create awareness where we're going and make it super stylish and mm -hmm. something that people would want to wear every single day? So that's the thought process behind it. And I, I was pondering on it for so long. Like literally in my head, I'm like, okay, six months, uh, <laughs> for the last six months, I want to make the best possible merch on the planet, honestly. Like, 
I don't just want to be something that's yeah. that's uh, as simple as support the channel. Um, yeah. So I, I've been yeah, doing that, and it's been super super fun, you know, like for me. And I gotta send you a free shirt, bro. Oh, I please do it. It's Can so I send hard. You a free shirt? I, I, I okay. wanted to. Yeah, of course. Yes, I get a shirt from Fox. I'm gonna wear it when I do some <laughs> interviews. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna wear it proudly. And but I have to add something. I I, I was. It, it's so funny for me. Every it's it's like I'm a copycat channel from your channel more or less now at this point. Because, no, seriously, <laughs> seriously. In some in some regards, it's so funny because when I want to interview someone, I'm targeting them. And suddenly you release a video with them. And I don't know, all the time, all the last couple of people you've interviewed, it was always like, for example, the limiting factor. I've had, had him on my eyesight for a long time. And then I start. okay, now I'm going to write him. Now he's following me perfect and stuff like that. And video might be coming up in December. We are in talks now. But um, Nice. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it, it's so funny. You're always a step ahead. And then I was, uh, I was texting you, hey, why I'm a designer, my wife is a designer. Why don't we do a collaboration merch line or something? And you said, Oh, we're on already at it. And I'm like, Okay, <laughs> okay, no, I'm, I'm very grateful for you. And also, it, it's funny because also the approach that you go with your merch line is the same approach I wanted to go with my merch line because for Hell me, yeah. it's like I'm gonna monetize my channel also more with the merch. I, I, I love that because I love to create stuff and I'm a designer and my wife's a designer, yeah. so yeah, I'm so. That will be maybe someday, some maybe next year, some somewhere around that mid next year, or end of next year. Maybe I'm gonna take it a little bit more slow than our rocket Farzad here, <laughs> who's always ten <laughs> steps ahead. But um, yeah, it's, it's just funny. I just <laughs> wanted to. No, add you're that. good, bro. <laughs> no, that's very flattering. Thank you, man. That's uh, no, and then I really I think, like I it. I, yeah, you're, it's, it's great you. design. It's also, the the big Farzad face is so awesome. I just that, that's also <laughs> the thing I really. That, that's uh, that shirt was one I I was about to order I I just forgot it then um sadly but but I was at it like okay how can I send it dude it's Germany? fine w yeah well but you can get whatever you want for free now bro like I'll send <laughs> yeah. you the link I'll send you a code and you can order whatever you like cool, cool. um I think mm. yeah for me man I as I'm thinking about okay what is the best way to create a channel that is um. Something that's going to be a legitimate, call it a business in the long yeah. term. Because that's ultimately, for for me to be able to create the best content possible, I have to ensure that I'm treating the, the content with the utmost respect. And it can't just be a hobby. It has mm -hmm. to be something that I'm passionate about. And for me to be passionate about it, the way I work is that there has to be an incentive for me to be pos uh, yeah, very course. passionate about it over the long term. And for me, it's not just making like making it a profitable thing. For me, it's like, how do I make something that people truly love and where I see the signal that says, yeah. hey, they love it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and of course, that's that's might make me money. Great, that's cool. But like, I can use that to make even cooler shit. Like that's, yeah, I'm exactly. at the stage of my it's, life it's, where it's I can like do that, you know? You invest in that idea and you, it has to be financially sustainable to do something. I, I totally get that and it makes so much sense. That it isn't sure. like, oh, I'm going to send everything for free. It's about you can grow your channel if you monetize. That's a good thing. And you will reinvest nearly everything in, in your in your business. Farzad Misbahi yeah. YouTube channel and even more. Yeah, it makes absolutely sense. But there's people out there. Yeah, but there's people out there too that can do a really good job not doing like Dave Lee is a is a good example, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Dave Lee is somebody that that leads by example in the in the world of I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this because I'm trying mm -hmm. to help people. Yeah, exactly. And I'm trying to get as much inspiration from that as humanly possible because I'm like, holy crap, that's extremely admirable. And it's clear that he he wants to do it from that respect. He wants to mm -hmm. be helpful and he he's being philanthropic and charitable in that respect with his time. Mm -hmm. You know, time ultimately is the most valuable thing we have as human beings. And that's the most important. Um, I think for me specifically, I, I just like building businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I've been doing my yeah. whole life. You know, it's like not just at at, at, at work, like, mm -hmm. at the, you know, the, the jobs that I've had where essentially I'm running my own business and I'm trying to build out the yeah. thing for, you know, obviously for the company, but I'm also given the freedom of acting as entrepreneur outside of building my own business as an escape mm -hmm. room, this yeah. channel, this merch line. Yeah. It's just fun for me. So, um, yeah, and I think the, yeah, it, 
the most important thing also with that, now we get, go back to the beginning of this episode, is authenticity. If you love to do merchandise, if they see like, oh, it's just yeah. a monetization strategy for him. It's like, yeah, I buy my merch without love or without focus. And I mean, you're doing the designs with your wife together or am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, so I, exactly. I whip them up and then my wife's like, this sucks, change this. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> okay, like, cool. like, so she's she's my gating factor for everything it, you know it, so she does look it's yeah. so it's authentic it's it's happy you're you're doing something in your free time that you have uh, you you put it in your business as well uh, people have fun with your merchandise so who is to harm dave lee for example is also authentic in his sense and also stephen mark ryan for example he monetized from the get-go he yeah. had this monetization strategy already in place before he even started the channel he was like planning his Patreon, you could really see that, how he, how he does it. And he also does a great job. It's also authentic because he doesn't lie about it. He's just open about it. It's obvious intention. Exactly, I think, I think yeah. that's ultimately what human beings really value is like, are you bullshitting me or yeah. are you being upfront with me? Like is people this, necessarily, yeah. I don't think have an issue. Like this is the one thing I've been trying to get over my head because this is like, this is my self-sabotaging thing. My thing is like, okay, um, I feel bad having a merch line, because that means people are going to pay for it. And I'd rather not do that. I, how can I figure out a way to like do everything for yeah. free and like make merch for free? I'm like, that's the dumbest thing you've ever thought of in life. Because I feel bad. It's like the weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is about me that, that feels like that. But like the more I think about the future of the economy and the more I think about the future of creators And if the, if this bot, and this is why this merch line is so near and dear to my heart, if this Tesla bot is really comes to fruition and we have an age of where, where the robots are coming to free up our time, that means that we are all going to be creators of some sort. If the physical labor aspect of our economy is replaced or displaced, then we are going to do things that are much nearer and dearer to our hearts. But we need tools to be able to do that, and we need incentive structures that en ensure that we do that, right? Because because I think I think humans, it, and I'm trying to put this within the, like the like the um, timeline of humanity. I read this book recently called Sapiens. Um, I don't know if you ever read that book, but it's basically a history of humankind. And what I find most interesting is that up to 10,000 years ago, uh, humans were nomads. Humans, you know, they ate from the ground, they hung out, they moved from place to place, they didn't have to tend to a farm, they didn't have to tend to, um, you know, uh, their, their homes or anything, they moved around, they had a good time, they told stories, they ate, they procreated, right, they just hung out, they chilled. And then once they figured out how to do agriculture, what ended up happening is uh, they now secured their food source. They no longer have to go around and hunt and gather and stuff and sort of have fun along the way. Now they can plop down in one place, farm, and then now their like food source is secured. But ever since that moment started, humans have been tied to a spot and they've been tied to a living to ensure their future instead of doing what we did from 200,000 to 10,000 years ago, which is just be free And, and just roam uh -huh. and navigate the world and see, and you know, 99.5% of our, of our existence has been this more free flowing natural state that we're in, I, I would call it. And the last 10,000 years we've been tied to, okay, we have to farm. Uh -huh. If we don't farm today, we go out of food and oh my goodness, that's a risk to our survival. We can't do that. And this anxiety started kicking in, right? Yeah. This anxiety of doing it. With the bot coming, like this is, this is how fundamentally Uh, different the world is going to be, I think. It's going to take decades for this to happen, but it will happen, in, in my opinion, is we're going to go back to how we were 10,000 years ago. Is that now we're going to have the time, we don't have to necessarily worry too much about our food sources and our shelter, uh, per se, because we're going to be living life in a much more free manner. So what does that look like in an age where you have the internet, where you have Twitter, where you have... I don't know, AI, you have Dolly, you have uh, just, there's so many things that are happening right Starlink now. Starlink on your roof, you could you could have a camper or something like that with solar panels on the roof uh, with energy storage, uh, with a Tesla exactly. battery in you roam. and stuff like that. It's, yeah, I get, yeah. yeah. But what are you going to do with your time? Yeah. But what are you going to do with your time, right? That stuff is so fascinating to me. 
and I, and I've poured <laughs> I've poured my heart into my channel and everything that I create with that long term vision mm-hmm. of what is it going to look like, what what's going to happen, and. I don't know, man. It's just, I think it's important to talk about it as much as humanly possible. And for this merch line, like that's that's what I'm trying to pour into. No, it. Okay. And, I, and I'm mm-hmm. iterating, I'm iterating over time, uh, uh, you know, uh, about all the lessons I've learned at Tesla and before that and all the things that I've done is like, hey, just keep iterating, keep making it better, keep making it better, keep making it better. And, uh, but everything I do, I think is within that context. And I hope that journey in it, in it on its own inspires people as well. Yeah. I hope for the people that feel like, they're not really sure if they should embark on something or if they yeah. should take a risk or really I, pursue their truest passions. Like I, I hope I'm somebody that they can view through my journey and be like, okay, this is, I also have confidence that I want to partake this, you know? I have to add again, this was one of the biggest points I took from you, the approach of just frigging doing it. Because I have perfectionism in my mind. It's blessing and also horrible at at the same time. It can be both. Um, I can create a very great stuff, but it can take hours and hours and hours, and I'm too perfectionistic most of the time. That's one advice I've took from you, or or one thing that inspired me the most was that particular point of just doing it. Tesla impacted you in that regard, also that you just um, your pacing was fast. You just iterate. You you move on. And um, that's something I, I always struggle with. And that was something that really, really inspired me. So you had an impact on me, for example, to launch the channel. And also, if I don't upload weekly, for example, because I have no time, I, I can't, I, I don't know how to do it. I can't do it. Many people, some people can do it. I edit my videos all the time. I cut between the clips and I'm editing right now. Probably future Jan will edit this video. <laughs> and uh, he hears me now talking about this. But Your approach of just doing it and using, for example, StreamYard because it's easy, it's fast, it's just it, it works. It's just it's a solution. How what's it about? The channel is about people li- listening to you and other people. Do you need editing? Do you need that? But I'm still uh, finding my way to in between that between perfectionism and just output. And um, but this is something uh, like highly impacted me also. So, so I can give you that. That's humbling. This is really something that kept in my head. And you're, for me, the OG interview guest that will always be like the starting point of my YouTube career, <laughs> if you can say it. Yeah, it's, it will be. You'll be very Thank special you, in my channel, in my DNA of my channel. Thank you, brother. Yeah. That's I wanted you, to add. That's, yeah. that's very humbling. Thank you so much. That, that means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you. I, um, my biggest piece of advice to anybody that wants to do anything Read Atomic Habits. <laughs> oh, okay. Phenomenal book. Yeah, I'm gonna super link good every book. Books, but uh, really the, yeah, I'm going to link them. Yeah. Like, I would say Atomic Habits is... Um, I was fortunate that I, I already operated in that manner. And really, the, the thought process here is that you, f- you make things you want to do as easy as humanly possible, and it becomes a overarching, like, theme of just get over your insecurity. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just freaking do it. Force yourself to be uncomfortable. Force yourself to h- hate yourself while you're going through this journey. Because the lessons you're going to get through that imperfection and through those flaws and through the, I hate looking at myself and I could have done this a thousand times better. It's a mentality shift. It's not, it's not a, oh, I suck at this because everybody sucks at everything the first time they do it. It's okay. I'm going to do this better next time. I'm going to do this better next time. And the easiest way to go on that journey is by making the obstacles to create that thing as easy as humanly possible. So when it comes to creating YouTube videos for myself, the example that I use is that I do it so that I have to do as little prep as humanly possible, as little editing as humanly possible, where I can just literally do my, even my studio right now, I have it on Alexa and I walk in, I want to make sure she doesn't uh, do this, something crazy because yeah, yeah. I just said the word, uh, yeah. but uh, okay, we're good. That I, <laughs> Everything I, I say, shuts hey, down. turn on. <laughs> Yeah, turn on studio. I say turn on studio, the lights go on, the camera goes on, the side lights go on, everything goes on. And awesome. then I can just go in front of a computer and start going. Like that's the kind of mentality I have is you just have to make everything as easy as humanly possible. And investing time in that, making it easy, for me, it's fun. And maybe this <laughs> yeah, is why yeah. I consider myself a little lucky. So like if you find that to be fun, 
then you can do whatever. You can do anything. It's just a matter of it becomes an it becomes a psychological fight with yourself yeah. to and sh- you know to tell yourself that you are worth it. You are good enough. Mm-hmm. You are. Uh, you are going to learn through this journey. You will make mistakes. You will mm-hmm. look like an idiot, but don't beat yourself up over it because that's the only way to get better. And the vulnerability you'll show through that journey ultimately is what people value the most because that should inspire many to be like, wow, Farza looks like a moron, but I kind of like his stuff. Why can't I do it? Exactly. You know? So it's that kind of, it's that kind of, byproduct of doing the thing that you're doing that honestly could be way more valuable than whatever you're saying. It's about, it, you know, it ins- if it inspires somebody to go on their journey, that's ultimately the best thing we can do as humans. Think of it selfishly. If all of us do what we love, the economy will be the greatest thing in the world because then everything yeah, will be fucking and, awesome. Yeah. Everybody would be awesome. Everything would be awesome because it's a labor of love that's mm-hmm. creating the things and the services, right? Yeah. And Ultimately, that's that's how I that's how I think about everything I do, and uh, I hope it inspires people. And what you're doing with your channel is amazing, honestly, Thanks. because I can tell it's a labor of love. Your production value is insanely good, like so good. I'm jealous, honestly. I'm like <laughs> I should probably invest in better equipment, but I should probably save my my money so I can buy more Tesla stock at some point here. You know, so <laughs> Eleven, it's. Yeah. You have so many good things going for you, bro. Like you really do. And and once you are able to find the time, because you know there are more important things going on in your life, obviously. Yeah. And if you do find the time, or you decide to give more time, I am a hundred percent sure you're going to be a surefire success. Like it's obvious. It's just it's just time and yeah. accepting the 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 troths and the shitty parts of being a creator mm-hmm. you know the shitty comments the the no one's watching my video this week because everybody's paying attention to russia ukraine you know mm-hmm. it's like all these things that happen as a creator that it's just part of being a creator mm-hmm. um just surviving them and learning from those moments you know yeah <laughs> yeah <I have> to. <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah it's, it's you're 100 right i think um this was great what you've said like it's now it rounds up the episode very much because um we had some words about creating again on the end and the beginning it's about the 1000 subscriber that. special it's also a special right now because Maybe of the milestone we do know what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah and and it's it's great to hear your words um really kindly appreciate it and i really uh liked what you said of course you deserve them yeah thank you thank you thank you and um i hope also that that this inspires one of the viewers to just do your passionate thing you want to do yeah and be a little bit like farza just just step in and just go at it if you're passionate about something be a little bit like you or like me or like other creators you've uh, done this yeah i haven't done what you've done you've done this (laughs) yeah yeah thanks yeah yeah farza thank you very very much to be on this show this time and this special moment also and also your first video was about a year ago which is crazy crazy Absolutely best timing ever then. Maybe you have something up upcoming that you want to plug or anything. Do you have something? Of course, you merch. We, we've talked about that. I'm going to link <laughs> uh, your shop in the description, of course. And yeah, maybe you have to say something to our audience while we're at it. Yeah, thank you for having me on, dude. Like, uh, congratulations again. Thousand subs is a big deal. It's yeah. a really big deal. I think this is just the beginning for you, like I said at the beginning. I'm very excited to see your journey. Keep doing exactly keep doing exactly what you're doing. Okay, I'm gonna. Um, <laughs> you're inspiring much many more people than you think. More mm-hmm. more likely, you know, like most people that watch stuff don't comment. Yeah, but I think most people most people feel the positivity mm-hmm. and really the value you're bringing to the community. So you, you're doing great. Keep going at it. Honored to be part of this episode. Honestly, thank you so much. Um, yeah, to the public, I think like everybody who's watching this. I hope I hope this inspires you in some way. I hope ultimately what it comes down to uh, being a human being is that you know we're all in this uh, world living next to each other, pursuing our passions, pursuing the things that we love. We use these videos to try and like you know view and learn more about the things that we love to connect with it. But ultimately, I would encourage everybody to just lean hard into the things that make you happy, especially in, in this time yeah. in the world where you know we have a lot of conflict. 
Uh, the economy in some places is not doing too great. We've had crazy inflation. You know, we all follow this sort of Tesla stock and everything not doing too hot, but that's it is what it is. And, uh, you know, Elon Musk is doing his thing, which might stress out a lot of people. It's it is what it is. Ultimately, we're individuals and the things we should be doing is investing in ourselves, invest time in ourselves, in our families, in our friends or the things that just make you happy. So just a it's a reminder of that. If that's starting something, if that's building something, if that's spending more time with somebody or something, you should do it. Just just prioritize yourself and love yourself and make sure that you're constantly telling, telling yourself that you have the tools to make whatever you want to have, want to make happen, happen. Just make sure that you're giving yourself that time and that recognition so that you are able to do it. And I think Jan and I, however small we are in this little world, are proof of you can pursue your passions and be happy and then create amazing friendships along the way. Like, you know, I, I consider you a good friend of mine. And you know, I, I, I really feel like I can sit down and just talk to you about really anything. So, and I really value that relationship. So thank you so much. Yeah, I hope, I hope this has helped somebody out there that's watching this in whatever way, if it's Tesla related or whatever, individual related, I hope it's helpful. And yeah, man, I can't wait for us to sit down and, and chat again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. And there's only one last thing to say. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>